Hey there, welcome back to another video on first language acquisition. In the last video, I talked about linguistic markers that tell you who did what to whom. Okay, so markers like word order or like morphological affixes or prosody, they indicate uh, whether someone was the doer of an action or the undergoer of an action. Yeah, and with uh, a system of such markers in place, languages can actually build up a large repertoire of complex advanced syntactic constructions. So when we um, have a situation that we want to talk about, uh, we can do so with a broad range of syntactic constructions. So here we have an angry looking person who asks uh, what the hell happened here? Yeah, and we can actually describe that scene with a range of different constructions, uh, including Thomas broke the window, so that would be a standard transitive uh, sentence. Thomas broke the window with a ball. The ball broke the window. The window got broken, a passive construction. What Thomas did was break the window, a so-called uh, pseudo-cleft or WH-cleft construction. Um, it was the ball that broke the window that is an IT-cleft construction. So you see that there is actually a wide variety of choices that we have to describe one and the same scene. And this may seem to you like a bit of a luxury. Yeah? Why does English need to have all these different um, variants of a description that boils down to the same thing. Yeah? Boy, ball, window, window broken. That's basically what happens. Yeah? So obviously there is a reason for that. And if you want to, you can pause the video here and think for a minute or two for yourself. Uh, why does English have all these different variants? Yeah? I'm going to continue now. Um, the explanation behind all these different choices is that constructions don't just describe who did what to whom. Okay, so all that stuff that we talked about in the last video, that's important. Yeah? We need to indicate uh, which is the subject, which is the object, and so on and so forth. However, there's more to syntax than that. Namely, uh, there's what linguists call construal. Construal means that constructions don't just describe who did what to whom, but they also describe a perspective on events in the world. So language, that's important to realize, is never just a neutral, objective way of describing things in the world. There's always, or at least very often, already a point of view, a perspective inscribed in your description of things in the world. Yeah, that is what's called construal. And if you look again at this list of examples, you notice that, well, these different variants, they allow us to highlight things. <clears throat> they allow us to downplay things or omit things. Yeah? So some of these examples have the ball in it as uh, a participant. Some of them don't have the ball. Some of them don't even have Thomas. Yeah? The window got broken. No agent, no instrument, just the window that somehow, well, disintegrated for some reason. Right, so that is construal. Um, you <clears throat> have a perspective that is part of the linguistic uh, description. Right, so how do children learn these abstract and complex syntactic patterns? There are several processes that underlie the learning of syntax, not only with regard of who did what to whom, but rather with regard to construal and the kinds of constructions that allow you to uh, integrate your perspective into what you're describing. So the discussion in this video draws on chapter five in Michael Tomasello's Constructing a Language. And uh, well, chapter five has the title Abstract Syntactic Constructions, and that's what we're going to talk about specifically we're going to talk about four processes that underlie the acquisition of complex syntactic constructions, namely analogy, um, distributional analysis, entrenchment, and preemption. So in the next minutes, I'm going to talk about each of these four processes. So without um, 
any further ado, let's jump right in and talk about analogy. Now, analogy is probably a term that you've heard before. Yeah, So you can draw analogies when you say that, okay, this is sort of like that. Yeah, So um, that would suggest that analogy is something like a simile or a metaphor of sorts, and that is not entirely wrong. Okay, <laughs> let's start with a non-linguistic example. On this slide, you see a little puzzle, and the puzzle involves arrangements of geometrical shapes. Okay, so up here we see a pair of uh, two such arrangements, and here's a third arrangement, and we're supposed to figure out its partner. Okay, so this belongs to this, and this here should belong to A, B, C, or D. If you want to, you can press pause and figure out for yourself which of the four arrangements we're looking for here. Three, two, one. Of course it's D. Yeah. So, but why is it D? I'm sure that you're going to tell me, look, it's because there are relations, correspondences across shapes and across colors. And if we look at the correspondences across shapes in the first pair, we have a square and a square, a triangle and a triangle, a thing with eight corners and another thing with eight corners. And so that should be the same here. Yeah, circle, circle, diamond, diamond, square, square. Um, and uh, here with A, C, D, we actually have that kind of arrangement of shapes. Okay, but we also have colors. And the colors, uh, when we look at this first pair, there seems to be a relation of, well, we have red here and red there, stripey here, stripey there, and white. Well, if it were to go down, it would be here, but it had to go up. So what we should have here is the squares in the middle, the gray at the bottom and the white at the top. And this is exactly what we have in arrangement D. Okay, so far so good. So we figured out this analogy. Uh, you didn't have to know that this was analogical reasoning to do it, but this just goes to show that, well, analogy, it's something we do. It's something that we have at our disposal cognitively. And um, at its basis, it is the perception of similarity in relations. Let me give you another example before we get to uh, linguistic consequences of analogy making. So here we have two pictures. And um, there's a famous experiment where the researchers gave pairs of pictures to people and asked them, are these pictures similar? And if so, why are they similar? So, you tell me, are these pictures similar? Most people say, yes, they are. Okay, but why? Um, I can think of one very good reason. Namely, there's one element in those pictures that is actually, well, the same or almost the same. Um, look at this child, yeah? Square, boxy pants, square sweater or whatever he's wearing, round head, yeah? and this looks exactly the same as this child over here. It's probably the same, yeah? Tim. Um, so that makes the picture similar, except that's not what makes people say that the pictures are similar. Um, okay, so uh, I'm, I'm being silly here, but... <clears throat> You, of course, recognize that these pictures are similar because both of them involve acts of giving in a way. Okay, so here we have the mother giving a glass with some liquid uh, to the child. And here we have the child watering the flower, that is, in a way, giving the flower uh, water. And so this kind of relation, yeah, someone who gives, someone who receives, and uh, a liquid that is being transferred from A to B. That is what makes these pictures actually similar. And that is what motivates people's responses. Again, this is similarity across relations rather than similarity in actual characteristics of these pictures. Yeah? So analogy involves abstractions. That's the main point that I want to make here. And analogy, again, is one of those 
domain general cognitive processes, processes that are cognitive and that are at work not only in language but in all sorts of cognitive uh, reasoning processes. Yeah? When you do a little puzzle like this, when you look at pictures, so actual life scenes and you understand those, but also when you use language. So let's get to that. I've said that analogy captures identity across relations and uh, generalizations across relations are used to uh, think of new instances of a category. So, for example, if we look at language, there is, in English, uh, an irregular verb, dream. Okay? How do you form the past tense of dream? If you ask your uh, school teacher, it's dreamt. Okay? Dream, dreamt. Um, except we have people who write dreamed or who say dreamed and that's not because they are wrong or just don't know any better that is because well irregular verbs tend to regularize with time yeah and uh, why dreamed and not any other way of forming the past tense well there are other verbs that have this correspondence uh, so the verb scream um, has a past tense, screamed. So in a way we have the A to B, yeah? so the two geometrical arrangements that we can take as a model, and then we take dream as the first one, and we think, okay, what should the past tense be if the relations are identical? And we do the math and we end up with dreamed. <clears throat> um, the regularization of irregular verbs is just one area of language where analogy is at work. We also see it in morphological productivity. So for example, the first person to ever use the verb underwhelm, okay, they probably thought, wow, this is really clever and funny. Um, and it kind of is, yeah. Um, and you see there another case of analogy being at work. We can uh, <clears throat> draw a comparison between the relation of over to overwhelm and project that to under and underwhelm. Analogy in language. <clears throat> so um, how do we get from there to the learning of syntactic constructions? One point that Thomas Ello makes in his chapter is that kids learn syntactic constructions, they form syntactic categories by forming analogies across utterances that look quite different. Okay, so they may have elements in common that are actually the same, but what is really uh, motivating the analogy is that the different elements stand in the same kind of relation. Let me give you some examples here. So imagine that you're a child and you hear the utterances, I throw you the ball, now you throw me the ball, let's throw daddy the blanket, and other sentences of this kind, okay? So the cognitive operation of analogy allows you to see correspondences across these utterances and allows you <clears throat> to uh, figure out that I and you, for instance, are on some level the same, okay? They are uh, both expressions that refer to the person who is doing the throwing. Okay, so this goes back to who did what to whom. Word order here is a cue. And uh, also pronouns like you and me and words like daddy, functionally, they are the same in these contexts. Okay, so you, me, and daddy refer to the person who is supposed to catch the thing that you throw. Okay, and then the last thing, the ball in the first two examples, the blanket in the third example, that refers to the thing that is thrown. So the child can um, form categories through analogy making. So the blanket is kind of like the ball in this utterance, if we take that utterance as the model. Yeah. So you see how this is not so different from our little exercise with the geometrical shapes or our assessment of similarity with regard to the two pictures. Okay, but it doesn't stop there uh, because we can form further analogies that tell us that the verb throw actually functions like 
other verbs uh, that occur in the same kind of syntactic frame. Uh, so you recognize this as a ditransitive construction. Yeah? Subject, verb, object one, object two. It works with throw, but also with a verb like tell. So I told daddy a secret is a ditransitive uh, sentence. And uh, this means that uh, the roles that we can abstract from utterances of this kind, they can get more and more abstract. So here we have a thrower, a recipient, and a thrown object. But if we draw analogies between throw sentences and tell sentences, we can say, okay, well, this is a uh, recipient not only of concrete objects, but also of information. And uh, this third constituent that can be a thrown object, it can also be a piece of information, it can be a story, it can be something else. So our grammatical categories, they become more and more abstract the more analogies we actually um, form. Okay. <clears throat> um, how is this done in practice? Well, uh, many constructions actually facilitate analogy formation in that they have a verb in them that occurs most frequently, that you can take as a model. Yeah? And from there you can branch out and figure out that, oh, other verbs behave in the very same way as this one. So, uh, in this table, you see that, for example, the construction in English that involves a subject, a verb, and some kind of location. <clears throat> Could be a pronoun like here, or a prepositional phrase like on the shelf, or into the box. That kind of construction involves the verb go in a large percentage of examples. Yeah? So here we have counts that are from a corpus of child-directed speech, and the caretakers they use go in this construction about 40% of all times. So this makes it easy for the child to figure out that, okay, this meaning goes with this syntactic frame. Here we have another construction, subject, verb, object, and then a so-called oblique. <clears throat> an oblique is an object that takes the shape of a prepositional phrase. So this would be something like, I put the box under the bed. Okay, and again, there's one verb that occurs very often in this syntactic frame, namely the verb put. Okay, uh, so we put uh, the food in the fridge. <clears throat> I put the child to bed, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and from learning a prototype with put, the child can branch out to different verbs that, um, well, that function in similar ways. Finally, down here we have the ditransitive construction, subject, verb, object one, object two, and non surprisingly, the ditransitive occurs 20% of the time with the verb give. So again, give forms the prototype, and the child can learn that, latch onto that, and then uh, learn other verbs that function in similar ways, like throw or send or tell. Right, analogy making. Um, it doesn't stop there, okay? So analogies can go on and on. You can add on to them, and you can add, add up, and you can end up with fairly high-level analogies. So here we have uh, four utterances that don't instantiate the same constructions. We have "I told Daddy a secret." That would be the ditransitive construction. We have daddy is in the garden. That would be an ordinary so-called predicative construction where we have a subject, a form of the verb to be, and then a kind of predicate. Yeah, can be a prepositional phrase in the garden, can be an adjective, um, ill or happy. Um, it can be a nominal, so predicate nominal. Daddy is uh, a doctor, something like that. Um, here we have a transitive utterance, you found it, and here we have an intransitive sentence, the duck sleeps. And, um, well, these constructions convey different ideas, they uh, have different verbs, 
they have different arrangements of arguments, so they look very, very different. But still, through analogy making, we can actually see similarities in relations across these uh, construction types. And for example, one similarity that we can see is that all of them involve a nominal component that comes first and a verbal component uh, that comes second. Yeah? So we have a subject and a verb phrase. <clears throat> if you think back to your linguistics intro class, I'm sure at some point you came across the uh, idea that, okay, sentences in English, they contain a subject and some kind of verb phrase. So noun phrase, noun phrase plus verb phrase uh, gives you a sentence. Well, this kind of insight would be a high level analogy that a child can figure out. Yeah. Okay, so that's the role of analogies. Uh, they allow you to abstract over individual instances of language use. The language utterances, they don't have to look the same. They just have to contain relations that you can perceive as the same. That is, uh, well, why analogies are so important and why Tomasello emphasizes them as much as he does. So, um, children perceive identity in relations across different events. Um, giving a glass of water to someone, giving water to a flower. So those kinds of events strike us as being similar on some level. And the same process that work when we perceive identity of relations across utterances, like I told daddy a secret, he gave me a book. Yeah, The elements are different, the relations, how those elements are arranged there are similarities and those similarities are the ones that we perceive. And as we go along, as we form analogy and analogy and analogy, that leads to abstract categories and abstract generalizations. So we end up with constructions like the ditransitive construction and we end up with uh, what's called grammatical relations. So notions like subject and object. <clears throat> um, okay. Um, with that, I'd like to come to the second idea that Tomasello discusses in the chapter, namely distributional analysis. Um, that sounds very technical, right? So what's distributional analysis? Let me demystify that a little bit because at the heart of it, it's actually very simple. So um, let me ask you a simple question. How do you know that apple is a noun and give is a verb? Because you do know that, yeah? question is, how? <clears throat> the reason that you know that apple is a noun and give is a verb, you may not phrase this in this term, in these terms, but um, it's there, yeah, I know it, um, is that apple and give differ in their distribution. That is, they differ in the way they occur together with other linguistic units. Let me just show you that. So we know that apple is a noun because it can take a determiner. So you've heard phrases like the apple or an apple and give doesn't do that. Yeah, The give and give a give. No, haven't heard that. Uh, we can modify apple with an adjective. We can say a red apple. You cannot say red give. Yeah. The two are distributed in different ways. Uh, we can pluralize apple, two apples, two gives. Yeah, we can put an S at the end of give. Then uh, it's he gives me something, but that's something different. Yeah, that's not the same as uh, there being two instances of giving or anything like that. Okay, so apple is a noun because it has these distributional characteristics and give has its own set of distributional characteristics. It inflects for tense and aspect, so we have a past tense form gave, we have a progressive aspect form giving, we have um, a combination of give with the infinitive marker to, yeah, I'd like to give you this. Um, give inflects for the third person in uh, the present tense, so he, she, it gives me something, and all of this um, adds up to a set of distributional characteristics that, well, you may not be aware, 
that this is what makes you think that give is a verb, but uh, it's certainly things that you can be made aware of. Yeah? So it's something that you know. Right. Um, let's talk about how distributional analysis actually begins with children. And it begins in a very humble way with pivot schemas. We've talked about pivot schemas. Pivot schemas are sort of the first uh, beginning of grammar in the child's mind, where we have a pattern that involves a fixed part, the so-called pivot, and uh, a part that is more flexible, where you can enter several different words. So a pivot schema like more x could be uh, instantiated by more milk, more juice, more cookies. And so the insight that the child has here at this point yeah, once they go beyond just hollow phrases and abstract from those hollow phrases to a pivot schema, uh, they would realize that, okay, the words milk, juice, and cookies, they all occur after this element that I know more. Okay, So they all combine in the same way. And this essentially is distributional analysis. Things combining in the same way, yeah, that is what gives you linguistic categories. <clears throat> so, children form categories of the elements that occur in the same pivot schema. And here we could say, well, milk, juice, cookies, those are what we as adults call nouns, okay? Uh, that is sort of the, the expert label that we have for this. The child doesn't conclude that, okay, so milk, juice, cookies, there's a category nouns, but rather uh, the category at that point is the kinds of words that go together with more, okay? It's kind of like a baby grammatical category that uh, the child abstracts away from actual language use, yeah? Starting small, starting with baby grammatical categories. Right, um, so then a process of generalizing across pivot schemas um, comes into being, yeah? Slowly but surely, the child realizes that, well, there's not just one pivot schema, there are several pivot schemas. And there are words that appear and reappear across different pivot schemas. So let's assume the child has acquired five different pivot schemas. <clears throat> My x, where's x, x in there, more x, and what's x doing? Okay, so... Um, some nouns, some elements, occur not just in one pivot schema, but in several. And uh, here I've highlighted a couple of them. So let's say, just for the sake of the argument, that the noun cookie appears in my cookie, where's cookie, cookie in there, more cookie, and what's cookie doing? <laughs> some, some cookies, they do things. Um, so at that point, the child would realize that well, maybe there is something that all of these pivot schemas have in common. So you can actually draw a generalization, not just across the words that occur in one pivot schema, but across pivot schemas and the open slot that they have. Okay, so that all of these elements are the same at some abstract level. Okay, so all these X's are actually members of the same category. And this is how adult grammatical categories such as noun would uh, gradually come into being. Yeah. So generalizing across pivot schemas. Um, another instance of distributional analysis, more complex than just figuring out the elements that occur in one pivot schema, but essentially the same process. Right. To uh, bring this to a close, distributional analysis gives you the insight that there is a word X that occurs in more than one pivot schema. And uh, this means that syntactic categories such as noun or verb can be learned as generalizations over pivot schemas. We can start very small and then gradually get more abstract and form these categories like noun, verb, and later subject, object, ditransitive construction, and so on and so forth. Um, just with regard to noun and verb, 
there is an important lesson here because um, there is a big difference between Thomas Ellis' account, yeah, usage-based linguistics, and all your generative theories of first language acquisition with regard to the role of these part of speech categories. So in generative theories, part of speech categories are something that the child starts out with and yeah, something that is actually pre-installed in the child's mind. It's part of the language faculty of the universal grammar that children are supposed to be born with. And in usage-based linguistics, that is not at all the case. Okay, so not only are you not born with knowledge of nouns and verbs, but rather uh, these categories only emerge gradually from distributional analysis. Yeah, so they're not even necessary in a way. Yeah? You eventually arrive at those categories, but they're not necessary for you to do anything with them, but rather they are what uh, is called an emergent phenomenon. Right, okay, so with that in mind, let's move on to the third uh, process that Thomas Ell talks about, namely entrenchment. Okay, what's entrenchment? Um, when you experience something very often, that experience becomes entrenched in your mind. So entrenchment is basically just something that you have memorized very, very well. Okay, so it has a strong representation in your memory as a result of repeated experience. <clears throat> this means that there are a number of effects, results of entrenchment uh, that we should talk about. Namely, um, well, strong entrenchment makes processing easier and faster. Words that you've heard a lot, like cat, yeah? They are processed easier, they are recognized faster, you can process them more accurately. So um, practice makes perfect. Yeah? This is uh, <clears throat> essentially what's going on there in the first effect of entrenchment. There's a second important effect of entrenchment that um, yeah, actually uh, as a consequence that looks quite different, namely that production of entrenched uh, linguistic units becomes routinized and reduced. So it may actually look a little sloppy. Yeah. So even though you've practiced something for lots and lots of times, well, um, take a frequent phrase such as I don't know. Yeah. When you record people saying I don't know, uh, this comes out not as I don't know, you know, this kind of careful pronunciation, it gets squished together and it sounds a lot more like I don't know, yeah? with the vowels being less uh, distinctive as they are in other expressions, with the consonants not being pronounced as carefully and distinct as in other contexts. So that is another effect of entrenchment. And um, you might wonder, well, if we, if our pronunciation is so sloppy and so reduced, isn't that uh, somehow a danger to communication? And you would be right, except these uh, expressions that we use a lot, yeah, they are expected by our hearers and they know about these reduced pronunciations. So there we can actually afford to be a bit lenient with our pronunciation. Yeah? So routinization, reduction, a normal effect of entrenchment and not a problem for efficient communication. Okay, um, there's a second aspect to this, which is the third uh, effect of entrenchment that's listed here, namely that complex forms, yeah? strings of uh, words rather than individual words, they acquire unit status, so they are fused together, if you like. So an expression like be going to is fused to gonna, and if you go even further, uh, you can say things like, yeah, I'm gonna try that later today. So I'm a, I am going to. So it's, it's fused together and has become reduced quite a bit. So this process is more about the cognitive representation 
of uh, complex forms. This is more, the second point is more about what comes out of your mouth, yeah? what another person can hear. Okay, fourth effect of entrenchment is the uh, preservation of irregularity. I talked about um, dream and dreamt earlier. So uh, there are verbs that are irregular that refuse to be regularized. Yeah. Um, so take for instance the verb keep. Keep has exactly one past tense formation and that would be the form kept. Okay, no one says kept. And that is because kept is a very frequent word in the English language. So if an irregular form is frequent, we remember it, it's well entrenched in our minds, and we are not tempted in any way to replace it with a form that we make up on the spot, like kept. Okay, with dream dreamt, well, it could be that we don't talk about the things that uh, appear to us in a dream all that often, and so there's just not that many opportunities to talk about what we dreamt the other night. And so you might forget that this form exists and you just say, I dreamed the other night. Yeah, With keep and kept, well, not so much. Yeah, we'll Talk a lot about the things that we kept or that someone kept going uh, or something of that sort. Right. Um, Okay, here's another infrequent verb, weep, where we have exactly the same kind of um, variation between an irregular form and a regularized form that will eventually replace the irregular form. Okay, right, four effects of entrenchment, easier processing, routinized production, unit status of complex forms, and preservation of irregularity. And with that, let's come to the fourth and final process that is at work when children learn syntactic constructions, namely uh, preemption. Okay, and this, this is quite complex, so let's see if I can get this right. Uh, so preemption is about learning not to say something. So there are constraints on constructions. You cannot use them uh, all the time. And evidently children in their early language learning career have problems with that. So they make what we call overgeneralization errors. Yeah? Uh, we goad and um, the child and so on and so forth. Yeah? Overgeneralization errors. I'm sure you know what that is by now. Um, and preemption would be one way of figuring out that, okay, this generalization does not hold, I need to use this other expression. Um, preemption manifests itself in different ways in the lexicon and in the grammar. Uh, with lexical verbs, the phenomenon is called blocking. So, uh, in English, there is the word thief, and because the word thief exists, there is no need for a word such as uh, stealer. Okay, would be possible to just uh, stick an er agentive suffix on a verb such as steal, but people don't do it, yeah, because there's already a solution available that is frequent and well entrenched and present in our minds. Um, yeah, uh, words that block other words don't have to be all that frequent. So the word poverty. Well, we all know it, but it's not a word that you use every day, but it blocks the possible word poorness. Yeah. Okay, so that's preemption in the lexical domain, um, morphological blocking. With constructions, blocking is called preemption by construction. That is, there is already a construction that does the job. So, uh, you cannot use another construction that could theoretically do the job. Let me give you one or two examples. So, um, <clears throat> in English there are some adjectives that are confined to a specific syntactic constructions. Basically, English adjectives are found in two places. Either they are what linguists call attributive, as in this is a red ball, so red is an attribute of the ball, um, attributive or predicative. Predicative 
means that we have uh, this ball and the form of the verb to be, and then there's a predicate, red. Yeah? Attributive adjective, predicate of adjective. Now, some adjectives in English just do one or the other. Yeah? Sheer only occurs in attributive uh, context. This is sheer madness. You cannot say this madness is sheer. Yeah? And there are other, um, <clears throat> other adjectives that behave in the same way. So this is not a um, idiosyncrasy of sheer, rather it is that there are these classes of adjectives that behave in this way. And now, as a child, yeah, what you learn is that, okay, elements like red, they can appear either before the noun or when you have verb to be, it can appear after the verb to be. And so you can draw a generalization that adjectives, you know, if you've seen one in the attributive position, you should be able to generalize to the predicative position. Huh? Um, how do you figure out that this is not true for some adjectives? Preemption. Yeah, so we need to talk about how this works. Just let me give you another example. Um, we have uh, in English the prepositional dative construction. John gave the ball to me. And we have the ditransitive construction, which basically expresses a similar scenario, the scenario of a transfer. So if we have give in the prepositional dative, John gave the ball to me, uh, we can be well, we can draw the inference that it should also appear in the ditransitive. John gave me the ball. However, again, there are some rogue verbs that don't appear in both, but only in one. And uh, one such example would be the verb explain, which appears in the prepositional dative construction, but not in the ditransitive construction. So you can say, John explained the news to me, but you cannot say, John, explain me the news. And um, the child has to figure out that even though the two constructions are doing just about the same job, there are some verbs that only participate in one construction and not in the other. How do they figure that out? Well, let's do a little experiment. <clears throat> so um, get pen and paper ready because you will need to write down descriptions of things that you see on the screen. So let me make this large. <clears throat> so write down what happens. Here we have two cows um, and here are descriptions of those cows. Yeah, Active, sleepy, and uh, as soon as I hit the next key, something is going to happen and you have to write down what happens, okay? Let's go, three, two, one, here it comes. Hmm, okay, write that down. If you've got it, I'm going to continue. Okay, we have two squirrels and here are descriptions of those squirrels. Those are not names, by the way. Yeah, Those are adjectives that describe these uh, two squirrels. <clears throat> and again, write down what happens. All right. If you've got it, I'm going to continue. Here are two lizards. And again, two descriptions of these lizards not names, descriptions, and you have to write down what happens. Okay. Oh, so cute. Um, two kittens, yeah. <clears throat> and you can read the descriptions and you need to write down what happens. Okay. Let's go back to the kittens <clears throat> and let's talk about what you wrote down, okay? So here we have two cows, one active, one sleepy, and I'm fairly sure that what you wrote down, you know, what, what, what happened was that the active cow moved to the star. <clears throat> 
Here we have uh, a chammy squirrel and a zoopy squirrel, and I have no idea which one moved up. I guess it was the zoopy squirrel. Yeah, so the zoopy squirrel moved to the star. Here we have uh, a lizard that's a dax moving to the star, and here we have the kitten that's awake moving to the star. Okay. <laughs> What's this business all about? Yeah. Um, it's about the kitten that's awake, okay? Um, adjectives like awake in English, they have this interesting distributional characteristic that you cannot use them at um, in an attributive construction. So you cannot say the awake kitten moved to the star. Yeah? If you've written down the awake kitten uh, moved to the star, well, that's something that second language learners of English do a lot. Yeah, That's because your exposure to this kind of adjective and where you can use it is not that entrenched as uh, in uh, speakers who've been using English since they were um, babies. Yeah? So don't feel bad. Don't, don't kick yourself too badly about it. Um, but, uh, well, if you do this kind of experiment with... Um, speakers of English, proficient speakers of English, they will say things like the kitten that's awake moved to the star in order to avoid saying the awake kitten moved to the star. Right, and the question is, how do kids learn that? Yeah, How do kids learn not to say the awake kitten? Uh, the phenomenon is broader than just awake. Yeah? Uh, there are other adjectives like afraid or <clears throat> uh, aware, yeah, afloat, and of course there are other constructions that show similar phenomena. I talked about she explained him the news, or uh, she considered to go to the store. That's awful. Yeah, she considered going to the store is fine. She considered to go to the store is terrible. But there are many verbs where you can actually take either the infinitive or the um, ing form, and it's totally fine, yeah? <clears throat> okay, so how do kids learn not to say things? That is the question that you can address with this idea of uh, preemption. Um, let's slowly get into uh, the topic and consider a few hypotheses that could be brought up, but that ultimately don't get us there. So one hypothesis could be that children say these things, but they are corrected when they say them. Okay, that's a perfectly reasonable hypothesis. Children make mistakes. Yeah, there are overgeneralization mistakes. So it could be that kids say the awake kitten, and then the parent goes, no, 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 no. Tim, it's the kitten that's awake, and that's the way it's going to be. Um, however, there are problems with this. So. Uh, it's very rare that parents correct their kids' speech in this way. <clears throat> um, sometimes they will recast utterances like, Oh, you mean the kitten that's awake? Yeah, yeah, it moved to the star. Excellent. Um, but even then, yeah. So this is an unlikely explanation for how kids learn to say uh, the kitten that's awake instead of the awake kitten. Here's another hypothesis. Uh, children don't hear these sentences during language acquisition, and so they find them unacceptable later on. So if I never observe someone saying the awake kitten, then I might be able to conclude that, okay, you know, that's something that you say differently. However, also that has its problems. Yeah? There are many creative uses of language that children don't hear and that you find absolutely acceptable later in life okay um actually well this is another uh wisdom that i'm sure you've come across in another linguistics course of yours you can you know take take any of those books back there you can open them up at any page you know put your finger down and you will find a sentence that you haven't seen before in that form <clears throat> and still it's fine yeah, it's still grammatical. And uh, there are truly creative uses of language 
that we still find perfectly acceptable, like the dinosaur swam his friends to the mainland in the children's book, where there's a dinosaur and he has three friends and uh, they somehow end up in the ocean and need to be rescued and you get the picture. Yeah. Okay, so we need a different hypothesis and this is where preemption or statistical preemption uh, as it's sometimes called, comes in. And uh, the reasoning here is, uh, well, it's a little complicated, but uh, let's work through it. The assumption is that children perform counts, frequency counts, okay? So they hear verbs and nouns and other linguistic elements, and they take note of the contexts in which they are found. So let's focus on verbs. If a verb is very frequent and it appears in one construction but not in another, that means that it is not distributed just by chance. Okay, So a frequent verb, just because it's frequent, should appear in this construction and that construction and this other construction because it appears everywhere. Okay, Now, if it's very, very frequent and appears in one construction, but selectively not in another, there must be a reason for that. Okay, So this is an absence that is conspicuous, that you know, catches your eye, not consciously, but subconsciously. And that is interpreted as meaningful, as a grammatical constraint. So let's take a concrete example to make this more tangible. Uh, so you often hear dad said something funny to Sue. Yeah. So there's the verb say, the verb say, super frequent in English. You hear it in other contexts like, yeah, he said this, or uh, there's something I want to say, and so on and so forth. However, you never hear say in the context of the ditransitive construction. Dad said Sue something funny is, um, well, you ask proficient speakers of English or you just listen to your own gut feeling and your gut feeling is going to look at that sentence and it's going to say, yuck, that's a terrible sentence. Yeah, that's a terrible ditransitive. And uh, given that say is a very frequent word, uh, this absence in the ditransitive cannot be just due to chance. It cannot be that you know you just didn't happen to come across an example, but rather it is that speakers specifically avoid that verb in that construction. So you conclude that dead said Sue something funny is not something that can be said. Yeah? And this is a very fundamental conclusion because uh, ordinary linguistic wisdom has it that uh, you cannot really get negative uh, evidence from the things that you hear. So negative evidence would be information about things that you cannot say. But with this kind of reasoning, with preemption, you can form negative evidence. Now, what do we need for this type of processing? We need relative frequency counts of a verb in two or more constructions that do functionally similar jobs. And those relative frequencies will determine whether or not the verb is acceptable in either of those two constructions. So let's take another example. Let's take the verb disappear in English, which is fine in the intransitive construction, the woman disappeared but which cannot be used in the transitive construction. So you cannot say something like the magician disappeared the woman. That just doesn't work. It works with other, with other verbs. Yeah? So the ice melted, the sun melted the ice. That's fine. Disappear doesn't work in this way. And you somehow need to figure out why. Yeah? So how do you do that? Well, the way you do it is that in contexts in which you could uh, assume that people would say the magician disappeared the woman, they do something differently. Namely, they use a construction that is more complex. They say the magician made the woman disappear. So in other words, the speaker makes an extra effort to do something that apparently cannot be done with a construction that is simpler. Speakers avoid the simple transitive construction and they use this more complex causative construction to convey the same idea. 
Now, interestingly, preemption is not just something that happens in language, but it also happens in other cognitive domains. There is interesting psychological work that exposes children to scenes that may seem a little strange at first. So here you see a woman who is operating a light switch in front of her on the table. And you see that in both conditions, she is operating the light switch with her head. Okay, so you're turning on a lamp with your nose or your, your, your forehead. Um, and in this condition here, in the first condition, there's a very good reason for that. Namely, her hands are tied up in a blanket, and so she cannot use them. Okay, <clears throat> whereas here in the second condition, her hands are right there on the table. So the children uh, have to wonder, well, why isn't she using her hands? There must be an explanation for that. Okay, so the test phase of the experiment, of course, is that the children are asked uh, to please turn on the light. Yeah, so the experimenter goes, well, Timmy, uh, could you please help me and turn on the light? And the children who have observed this scene, well, most of them actually use their hand to switch on the light because that is the easiest option. Yeah, but in this condition, many of the children have concluded that, well, I think you're not supposed to use your hands for that. Yeah? So only a small percentage of children use their hands. So uh, hand usage is somehow preempted by the fact that they're available in principle, but still people don't use them. Right. So also preemption is one of those domain general cognitive processes that underlie language, but that are not specific to language. Right. So that is the overview of processes that drive syntactic learning, analogy, distributional analysis, entrenchment, and finally preemption that uh, allows you to learn constraints on constructions, how you cannot use them in certain contexts. That's it for today. Uh, for next time, please continue reading chapter 5 in Tomasello, pages 162 to 181. Fill in the online quiz and uh, let me know if you have questions. Put them in the comments below. I wish you a good week and I'll see you next time.